day two gave us three late-breaking live sessions. Heart Rhythm TV is here in New Orleans, and your wrap-up starts now. This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung with the whole Heart Rhythm TV crew. We're here for our day two wrap-up. So much to pack in for one day. 12 clinical studies, different results coming out from all different areas of new energy sources, some autonomics. Let's jump right in here, Clint. You were there front and center for the first session. Yeah, the first session was great. We had, uh, you mentioned the new energy source. Prash Sanders from University of Adelaide presented the results of his study. Um, multi, uh, multi-pulse therapy, uh, overall less than one joule total of, of energy deliveries to cardiovert. Um, all done during procedures, so the one criticism that came up was inability to assess pain and tolerance from patients due to general anesthesia, um, but fascinating nonetheless. Uh, in that same session, we had uh, the Euporia Registry. Um, Boris Schmidt from Germany presented that. Uh, Europe's experience with PFA, um, very fascinating. Similar efficacy rates to our current modalities of ablation. Um, 58 minutes skin-to-skin -skin time, I think mm -hmm. really caught some attention. Uh, well, really clearly, PFA seems faster, fine. Is the efficacy any better? Peter Kistler brought up the fact that maybe it's about the same. You know, have we topped out an AFib at around 80%? We saw that manifest, and now we're seeing it in this series as well. Yeah, interesting idea for sure. He pointed out a pretty flat learning curve too. Some novice operators achieved good uh, results. And um, they have some important differences. They don't use much uh, general anesthesia in Europe. Uh, and only one third of the cases use a mapping system, which was interesting. So, But we have LEMP, this low energy multi pulse, which is what you're talking about. And we have high power short duration, but now we're talking about low energy sources. So I think that's really novel. And I think this is a lot of the work that Igor Efremov has been really pushing forward, and we've even seen it in the VT space, so I think there's much more there to come. Yeah. What did you see, Mahek? Well, um, I was at the late-breaking session for CIEDs. Uh, lots of exciting science. Uh, Dr. Friedman presented the results of EVICD 24 months out. Um, as, uh, you know, the EP world is talking about a substernal mm -hmm. extravascular uh, ICD lead. Um, it's great that we're exploring more extravascular uh, devices and leads. Uh, this uh, study uh, showed that ATP was actually very effective, 32 out of 35 effective ATP, which is a big improvement from uh, sub-QICD where we're not able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the extractions that they ended up having to do, which is again one question that comes up if it's substernal, is extraction going to be a challenge? We're able to be done with simple extraction tools, not in a CT surgery OR essentially. And when you talk with all the industry partners, the world is going leadless. And we also had some lead list from Dan Cantillon today as well, right, in New England Journal of Medicine? Yeah, I was able to catch that, Rod, and that was, um, that was really interesting. So first in man, um, dual chamber lead list, and just fascinating to see devices communicating with each other. Um, 300 patients, um, pretty good numbers in 90%. Um, some um, intraprocedural lead dislodgements, about six after the procedure. Um, but overall looked really promising at a fairly short follow-up, just a couple of months. So, um, yeah, real exciting. Dan, what did you see today? What did you love? Well, I'm going to start. I, I saw a lot of things I loved today. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start off with actually POTS. Really, really challenged patient population. But um, so non-invasive uh, tragus stimulation. So an hour a day, these, uh, these patients, 26 patients, double-blind, randomized sham-controlled trial. An hour a day, they get this non-invasive tragus stimulation to, to induce parasympathetic output mm -hmm. as well as reduce inflammation. And actually, heart rate vari variability went down. You know? that's, that's your 30% jump or 30B jump when you go from sitting to standing. So that actually was objectively better as well as inflammatory markers. Now, they, they hadn't fully analyzed the data on symptoms, and you got to know, for POTS patients, you got to know how the mm -hmm. symptoms do. But... I think signal within the data for that being better. So I actually, I mean, I thought that was very interesting. Well, such a frustrating condition for us, right. but most importantly for the patients. Uh, there just isn't much that we can offer there. And obviously the world of autonomics is looming over everything we do with atrial fibrillation. We had a standing room only today with cardioneural ablation, looking at implications even in atrial fibrillation from one Carlos Zerpa's group and Dr. Pachon. What did you see in that standing room only? Did you even get a seat? Yeah, th there was a surprise. It was a crowded room. There was no space for anyone else. And we see anatomical review. We see the evidence that we have already 
about RCT. We had one RCT available and more RCTs going with sham control, with control group also. And this is the new of the cardinal ablation. Is there exactly a road of the cardinal ablation, atrial fibrillation ablation? Let's see. We're going to prove that. Well, so many, so many people are looking at your center of what's happening with also the extra cardiac vagal stimulation, seeing even the initiations of AFib after a long pause, um, acetylcholine. This is really interesting. And that is a really important marker when you have control of the innervation and you have a test that is inducing AFib in all the patients. It's going to make a difference. Julie, you were at the last couple late breakers. I was. I was with uh, Mahak and the the third one, and I looked. I want to talk a little bit about the Praetorian trials. So we're talking about um, subcutaneous devices. This was an observational study looking at anatomical variables to predict DFT success. Um, and so they developed a scoring system for it, and a low scoring system was very predictive for a successful DFT, and a high score was predictive of DFT failure. So the lower the score, the better. And they had above 90, I think it was 99% yeah, root prediction. So yeah, right. yeah. very impressive, yeah. more good stuff from Renault Knops. Yeah, absolutely. And also spent some time down at the Allied Professional Posters um, today, some great work from the Allieds. Um, you know, the Allieds have doing a lot of quality initiatives, um, so doing their own ILR implants, doing their own cardioversions, um, so really maximizing and working to the top of their license and helping to offset you know, some, some physician work as well to give you time to do other things. And we also some, saw some stuff in the VT space. Impella did not appear to improve outcomes, really a continuation of what we've seen from Vivek Reddy's group showing, yes, you might be able to see more VT, but it doesn't impact VT recurrence. And there was also a very high complication rate led by Jacob Strubick and Pasquale Santangeli. Um, the other stuff that we just saw just coming out here off the stage was Pugal Vijay Raman looking at hot CRT, mm -hmm. a study from India even looking at MRI to screen for when you need a defibrillator or not for CRTP and CRTD. So we've seen it all from conduction system pacing, VT, new energy sources, autonomics and how that impacts these really frustrating conditions. So, And a couple plugs for interesting sessions that I, that I actually was able to attend. Um, so first off, floralis. Um, you know, I think that floralis is a movement within EP. And I think foundationally, you have to think of it this way, right? We're trained with fluoro. But, by, but the, the core concept, with fluoro, the heart is invisible. We're imputing where the heart is. So I, I you know, the, the, this is the first large programming by HRS with floralis. We owe Mansoor Razmini you know, an incredible debt for pushing this movement forward. And you know, when you make the commitment to reduce your fluoro, obviously keeping safety in mind, it unlocks the potential to use so, much, uh, so many other imaging modalities, ICE, I have to say that, and other things that actually will accelerate your ability to characterize substrate, improve safety, improve the longevity of your career by not wearing lead, reducing radiation exposure, okay? So really, I think making the commitment to reduce flora will actually unlock better tools in EP. So I love that I saw that program. And attract more into our field. Yes. And it is beautiful field of EP to say we can do all these procedures without this hey, you don't have STEMI call either. You know, why are there not more, inter more people going into EP compared to our interventional colleagues? There's a lot of advantages here that we're seeing procedurally and better understanding of anatomy. And a segue into another important content, you know, guidelines released around this recently, but um, arrhythmias in pregnancy. I think that, you know, the state of women's health in our country, you know, it, it's, we're in a new era. And um, so the session programming from HRS around that there was a ton of interest in the room because first off, this is, these are people, this is a patient population we need to think a lot about. And two, you know, uh, Kamala Tamarisa presented an interesting case of you know, difficult to manage VT in the middle of pregnancy, having the difficult conversations about what to do with the pregnancy, what to do when fetus and mother in, are in danger. You know, and understanding the restrictions because there are some very restrictive um, situations. Right. It's always a new, challenging consult to get. Right, and, yes. and the new uh, guidelines just came out yesterday for arrhythmia management in pregnancy and I had the chance to doc talk to Dr. Sorrell and exactly as you mentioned, very challenging population, not a lot of randomized data, hard to collect randomized data, but her opinion was that we don't treat these patients enough. Um, and so it's more important to pick up the phone, call a consultant, get your heads together and really not kick the can down the road because there's two lives at stake.
So, so Dan, coming back to the, the fluoroless trend, I suppose maybe a, a problem with PFA then, because that's been one of my concerns, that suddenly we're going back on the fluoro pedal um, with, with PFA. Well, um, actually, speaking with Atul Verma, uh, when, he, when, he, when we discussed Pulse AF a little while back, he talked about uh, there is heterogeneity for use of ice, right, across the world. But the ice centers, actually, um, that had, you know, the floral rates were high, but ice centers you use less fluoro. And there's the importance of contact. I don't know if it's contact force, but contact with PFA. And verifying contact with ice is valuable. So I think we, the story is to be written. I think to move forward with PFA, we have to move back a little bit to go forward, but that's a good question. <laughs> so we've had two guidelines, the conduction system pacing guidelines, pregnancy management with arrhythmias, three late breaking sessions that we were all at. It's been an incredible, action packed, jam packed day two with simultaneous publications. Advocacy still needs to continue up at a high level of fever pitch. I think there was a little bit of lower attendance at what do we do about the CMS cuts because it's not a one and done. This is a longitudinal dialogue that we need to continue being all together on with, with Heart Rhythm Society, EPAF, as well as ACC. So continued dialogue. And that is a wrap for day two, my friends. This was a great day. Live from New Orleans tomorrow, we're coming back to you. Stay tuned for day three. This is Heart Rhythm TV.